Good morning, folks. Uh, today we're going to talk about compliance and legal issues in international HR. And um, for those that have worked in, in international settings, uh, you know and you realize that there's a lot more to it than, um, than what we do here in the U.S. Uh, what you tend to find is that the complexity of the legal environment in most other countries is actually quite a bit more than what we have in the U.S., and we have a lot. Um, but relatively speaking, or comparatively speaking, when you look at where we are within the U.S. and, and how that all comes together, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we don't dictate from a legal perspective, whether it's, you know, benefits or compensation or time off, that kind of stuff. So while there are some laws that may uh, run around, some of that, for the most part, is not nearly as stringent and, and already predefined as it is in most other countries. So when we're looking at where we're going to sit um, and where we, we need to go, you, you need to look at the types of laws that you need to research when you're looking at going into a new country. So certainly the EEO and anti-discrimination aspects, the wage and hour law, which includes the benefits of time off, severance and notice requirements, which are often uh, quite substantial in most other countries, tax laws, and finally immigration laws. So when we look at EEO and anti-discrimination laws, you need to understand which groups are protected in specific countries. So the U.S. is no longer quite as progressive as what it used to be. Now it's, it's really quite middle of the road. So we protect the basic sex, race, ethnicity, color, religion, age, disability, veteran, and uh, more recently, unemployed. Now, there's other things we're looking at doing, uh, certainly LGBTQ stuff um, and, um, you know, sexual preference, and there are some other ones potentially that may come up. That's probably the next one that's going to pop up. Europe is actually quite a bit more progressive than us at this point expanded it to include the sexual orientation and transgender, which we have not done yet, although some of the states have jumped in that direction. Latin America varies quite substantially by country, uh, but is a bit more similar to Europe than, uh, than the U.S. And the Middle East, uh, by and large, is the least progressive, and it has limited protections. So it is not uncommon if you're going into Middle Eastern countries or several of the Middle Eastern countries that there are restrictions in terms of uh, the types of jobs that women can do, the types of jobs that certain uh, foreigners may be able to do. Uh, there's very much a, a traditional caste system, and there's quite a bit of open discrimination uh, based on gender, ethnicity, and religion. <clears throat> Wage and hour laws. So questions that we need to answer before setting up operation in a country, things such as wages, looking at the minimum wage, uh, what are the overtime provisions? Are there any exemptions for them? How many hours in a standard uh, work week? Typically, we're looking at a range between 37 and 45. Uh, certain countries in Europe, like France, tend to uh, be more progressive in that they've got lower uh, hours uh, or weekly hours, whereas areas a lot of, uh, of times in the Middle East, it tends to be a 45 and defining the difference between employee and contractor. And this is one of the areas which I find to be probably one of the most substantive, substantive differences that we have out there in looking at what is an employee versus a contractor. So within the United States, we've got uh, very defined laws that dictate whether someone is an employee or a contractor. I always tell my staff or always tell my managers whether someone is an employee or a contractor is not one of choice. It's defined by the law. So we've got different questions that we ask, um, whether they are, you know, utilizing their own equipment, whether they are taking direction from our folks, whether they have set schedules, set times, set places where they need to do the work, whether they have the capability of making a profit or loss on the project. Um, so there, there are several questions that we're looking at. Now, when we get into other countries, even Canada and a lot of Europe, the contractor role is quite a bit different. So there, it's, in those cases, oftentimes it is much more choice and it's much more loosely defined from the government. And a lot of that comes back to the way that taxes are treated. So in those 
uh, countries, there tends to be more holistic uh, tax base for universal or, or government-based health care, uh, government-based pensions, and, and so on and so forth, whereas the U.S. is not. So the U.S., a contractor is absolutely at a disadvantage many times from not being an employee and that the organization, the business is not funding their half of employment taxes or their half of the FICA taxes. So there's a lot more at risk there. They're not on, on the employer programs, benefits, pensions, all that kind of stuff. Whereas in, in most of, of, of Canada and, and other European countries and a lot of the countries around the world, since all of those are, are government-based and not employer-based, there's not as much differentiation. Benefits, what's the structure of health care, nationalized government or private? Um, employer-based or non-employer-based. The U.S. is one of the few countries out there that is not truly a nationalized or government-based health care model. Um, and the majority of what we have is employer-based. But most of what we've got or what we deal with in, in most of the countries that we go into is, is really a nationalized structure. So it's generally not employer-based. Now, it's not uncommon that there may be a privatized supplemental program that can sit on top of the national benefits, but um, generally speaking, they tend to be more nationalized. So what are companies required to provide by law? So again, when we were dealing with nationalized government health care, those are basically funded in the form of taxes. So there's no way to opt out or, or opt in for an employer or an employer. Within the United States, um, being an employer-based benefit model, it really is based on you know what is offered to employees and whether individuals are eligible and, and so forth. And until the passage of Obamacare, there really were no restrictions or requirements in terms of the types of benefit programs that were offered if they were offered at all. Um, so it was not uncommon at all to find uh, many employers, especially when it came to the lower end of the, the, the labor force, to come back and, and not offer benefits to their staff. Time off benefits. Are they legally mandated uh, holidays, sick and vacation? How much? You need to understand that. Again, here in the U.S., we have nothing that legally requires us to provide holiday, sick, or vacation for our staff. Now, there are some states that have begun to, uh, to implement mandatory sick time. Um, so that started in California and has spread to several others. Since then, right now, it tends to be about uh, one sick day or one sick hour per 30 hours worked is uh, kind of the, the consistent um, calculation that has kind of been adopted. Uh, but at this point, there's no federal law that requires it. Now, it's quite a bit different than most other countries that do mandate um, time off for legal holidays, sick time, and minimum vacation benefits. Then we look at mater paid maternity or medical leave. How long? So what are the requirements of the medical leave, job protection, benefits protection, continued wages? Here within the U.S., we have <clears throat> admittedly pretty paltry benefits. Uh, so under the FMLA, we provide unpaid leave for up to 12 weeks for the birth, of birth or adoption of a child or uh, a medical leave for either oneself or an immediate family member that is unpaid uh, lasts about 12 you know last 12 weeks as a maximum um, and during that time obviously we're required to continue benefits and to keep a position open more or less now most of the other countries uh, especially the industrialized countries offer substantially more than that so they tend to offer in, in the case of most of Europe, they basically offer a full year of paid uh, leave in the case of maternity, paternity, or sick leave. Um, so quite a bit different than what we do here. So here, if you're lucky, we tend to do things, most of the time it tends to be funded more from the perspective of um, 
of a short-term disability or long-term disability plan. There, in most other countries, it tends to take the form of a tax, um, in which case there's kind of a benefit plan uh, rolled in there. Other types of leaves varies by organization, but you want to know if there's anything else out there. Some countries uh, actually have what they would consider um, some mandatory, uh, additional mandatory shutdowns or leaves. Um, certainly when you get into a lot of Latin America, there are certain certain periods or certain times when it's expected that, that individuals will, will be given. Severance and notice requirements. Um, are there laws regulating separation? Do these include mandatory severance or notice requirements? Within the U.S., we have very little restriction other than what's covered by any collective bargaining agreement or um, union settings or any severance or notice requirements uh, set out in your policies and procedures. But by law, there's nothing spe specifically that dictates that you need to provide severance or how much severance. So most organizations tend to provide some severance. Generally, it tends to be relatively weak for the most part. When you get into most of the rest of the world, Europe, Middle East, and Latin America, it's much more progressive in requiring severance, notice, or both. So within much of Europe, within Canada, uh, which in, within much of, of Latin America and the Middle East, uh, most countries basically have a six-month notice period. So you have to identify folks and, and, and basically notify them six months in advance that they are basically going to be made redundant. And during that six months, they have the ability to, to apply, and hopefully uh, you may be able to, to find some additional uh, position for them in that time. So there are obviously positives and negatives associated with that. They, you know, the rest of the world tends to look at the U.S. as though we're, we're somewhat barbaric because we don't have those separate requirements. Um, you know, when I do a layoff, basically... I always say on a Monday I get the first list, by Wednesday I get the revised list, by Friday they're out the door. And that's generally how it works. So while it's, it's certainly not as beneficial to the employee as what you find in most other countries, from a business standpoint, it's part of what makes us much more nimble, much more able to uh, correct and right-size in, in, in cases where we run into uh, – times or situations when uh, when the economy goes south. So we're able to be much more, uh, much better at being able to adjust to the market trends than what much, much, much of the world does. So fundamentals of impacts. So these are individuals that are coming from outside of the U.S. and into U.S. So some basic things to consider. Standard type of scenario, John, the HR director for a U.S.-based firm looking to build a global business, gets a call from a senior manager informing him that he wants to hire an engineer from the UAE to work on a new project located in Minnesota. John's task is to make it happen, and John's challenge is to, you know, how do we make that happen? So there are big nine considerations. So you need to think about the immigration and work status, the relocation and travel, the work conditions, compensation, benefits, performance management, acculturation and assimilation, and spouse and family, and repatriation. And these are basically the same as whether you're doing an in-pat or an expat. So we're going to look at it from both perspectives. So from an immigration standpoint, you need to understand what's required for a foreign worker to attain authorization to work within the U.S. You need to have the appropriate visa um, in order for them to come in. The employee, or, the employee should not do any work on a project or be entered into the system until his or her work papers are complete and approved. And that is an absolute. So lots and lots of different types of visas that we deal with. E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, H1B, H2A, H2B, H3, L1, O1, O2, P1, P2, P3, Q1. So we got a whole alphabet soup of different employment visas. So employment first preference to E1 are priority workers, and these are persons with extraordinary abilities in sciences, arts, education, business, and athletics, outstanding professors, researchers with at least three years of experience in teaching or research who are recognized internationally, 
and multinational managers or executives who have been employed for at least one of the three preceding years by an overseas affiliate, parent, subsidiary, or branch of a U.S. employer. So if you've got somebody who's been working for you in a foreign organization, in a foreign country, but for a U.S.-based organization, then this is, you know, one of the opportunities you have here. So highly qualified, highly specialized type of senior uh, specialist employees. E2 visas, these are second preference visas. Professionals holding advanced degrees and persons of exceptional ability. So again, these are professionals holding advanced degrees or bachelorette degree in a, with at least five years of progressive experience in, a, in the profession, and persons with exceptional ability in science, art, and business. Exceptional ability means having a degree of expertise uh, significantly above that of ordinarily encountered in the sciences, arts, or business. E3, employment third preference, skilled workers, professionals, and unskilled workers. So skilled workers are persons whose jobs require a minimum of two years training or work experience that are not temporary or seasonal. Professionals are members of the professions whose jobs require at least a bachelorette degree from a U.S. university or college or its foreign equivalent degree. And unskilled workers or other workers are persons capable of filling positions that require less than two years of training or experience that are not temporary or seasonal. E4s are your fourth preference, and these are certain special immigrants, special status for certain immigrants such as Iraqis, foreign employees, or of NATO, etc. A lot of this will fall into, uh, we've heard a lot from Trump talk about uh, basically the, the lotteries, the visa lotteries and stuff, which by and large will come from that. Um, certain groups are identified and become eligible to, to be put into a lottery for an E-4 visa. And E-5 visa, immigrant investors, um, and these are foreign folks who are looking to invest substantially within the U.S. To qualify an immigrant investor, a foreign citizen must invest between U.S. $500,000 and $1 million, depending on the unemployment rate of the ge geographic area and a commercial enterprise in the United States which creates at least 10 new full-time jobs for U.S. citizens, permanent residents, or other lawful immigrants, not including the investor in his or her family. The H-1B. So this is probably the most common that we deal with in reality. This is where most of the professionals that we bring into the organization come through. So these are persons in specialty occupation which require the theoretical and practical application of a body of highly specialized knowledge requiring completion of a specific course of higher education. This category also includes fashion models and government-to-government -government research and development and co-production projects administered by the Department of Defense. So you can see here basically there have been 65,000 uh, H-1Bs and uh, that has been cut, <laughs> continues to be cut. Uh, as we go through. So the Trump administration has actually cut the number of H-1Bs in half uh, over the last two years or so. H-2A, seasonal agricultural workers, just as it sounds, these are folks that are coming in basically on a temporary work visa to support the agricultural work for the United States. H-2Bs, temporary or seasonal non-agricultural workers, these tend to be those that come in and uh, generally work in tourist industries such as hotels, cruises, restaurants, and so forth. Trainees, other than medical or academic, the H3, this visa type also applies to practical training in the education of handicapped children. And then we get into the L visas. So the L1 visa is an intercompany transfer who, within the three years preceding, have been employed abroad continuously for one year and who will be employed by a branch parent affiliate or subsidiary of that same employer in the U.S. in a managerial, executive, or specialized knowledge capacity. An L1 executive or managerial employer can remain continuously in the U.S. for up to seven years, and the L1B specialized knowledge employers are limited to five years. So, so these are folks who are working within a company who has, who is either U.S. based or has a 
a, a branch within the U.S., a subsidiary within the U.S., and therefore can bring them over. An O-1 visa, individuals with extraordinary ability or achievement in the sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics, or extraordinary achievements in the motion picture and television field. And um, so this is where actors and actresses and sports uh, folks come through. Um, I believe this is how Melania Trump got into the, uh, the country. The O2 visa is a person accompanying an O1, so this is generally their spouse and children. P1 visa, uh, individual or team athletes or members of an entertainment group that are internationally recognized, another route for them. P2, artists or entertainers who will perform under a reciprocal exchange program. P3, artists or entertainers who perform under a program that is culturally unique. A Q1 visa, participants in an international cultural exchange program for the purpose of providing practical training, employment, and sharing of the history, culture, and traditions of the alien's home country. So, Lots and lots of different visas out there, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, in reality, as I said, the majority of what we're going to deal with most of the time is going to be an H-1B. Um, if you worked in hospitality, hotels, and stuff, you may get into some of the other uh, types of visas to get some seasonal workers in. Uh, but by and large, most of the time, what we're dealing with is the H-1Bs. So then we can move on and start talking about the green card or the legal permanent resident. Um, and you get eligibility through employment. So a few different levels of preference. First preference, priority workers, including aliens with extraordinary behaviors, outstanding be abilities, rather, outstanding professors and researchers, and certain multinational executives and, and managers. Second preference includes members of professionals or professions holding an advanced degrees or persons of exceptional ability, including individuals seeking national interest waiver. Third preference, skilled workers, professionals, and other qualified workers. Fourth preference, certain special immigrants, including those in religious vocations. And fifth preference, employment creation immigrants, investors, or entrepreneurs. So the process of going through and getting your green card is, is you know, a multi-year uh, venture and uh, you know does require uh, some support and sponsorship by an employer. So moving on, looking at the work conditions. So we need to think about uh, abide by the U.S. law with respect to the hours, minimum wage, overtime, etc. Need to remember the wage and hour laws, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. So that anybody that we bring in whatever kind of visa it is, still has to abide by the U.S. laws. Relocation and travel. We need to consider what kind of relocation. Are we doing a full household move, including the sale of a home, the purchase of a new home? Are we providing a, a rental or corporate housing? Travel, how often, back and forth. Depends on if we relocate the, uh, the family. Sometimes travel is required back and forth based on terms of the visa. Uh, sometimes they need to go back and, and uh, exit the U.S. for a period of time, go get their visa renewed at their consulate in their home country. So you need to take that into account. Um, also, you'll want to define whether we're dealing with first class or economy class uh, back and forth. So while that we may overlook that sometimes, certainly you know, taking somebody, let's say, uh, from somebody from the Middle East or India, it's not uncommon that a first class ticket can cost somewhere in the range of six to twelve thousand dollars round trip, so it's a substantial cost versus an, an economy class that may be a thousand or two thousand. So those are things that you want to define up front and make sure you have agreement on. Compensation: How do we determine appropriate compensation for an expat? So when we're dealing with an expat, it's a lot different than an impat. So an impat is actually relatively easier. Um, because most of the world would like to come to the U.S., uh, at least at the time being. And, um, and so, you know, generally our taxes are substantially lower than they are in most of the rest of the world. And um, so we're, we're, we're basically going to be responsible providing 
more or less the what we would consider the prevailing wage, uh, which would be the appropriate wage or the comparable wage for the U.S. workers for the same position. That would be the expectation and the requirement by law. But beyond that, you don't need to provide a whole lot more in order to get folks into the U.S. Now, leaving the expat or leaving the U.S., getting an expat to move overseas is quite a bit harder. So you've got some different approaches that you look at. You've got the short-term business travel where you're sending them for a short period of time. Generally, you're just going to cover the cost of their uh, their travel and their housing and you know meals during that travel. No different than a domestic business trip. You can look to make whole if you're looking at a permanent uh, move. So in this case, you're going to look at what is the you know the difference in terms of uh, the the cost of living from going from the U.S. to wherever they're going and, and really uh, aim to make whole. You can do make whole plus fix, so some additional cost on top of this, or make whole plus incentive. So you have an incentive component usually tied to project performance. So when we're looking at impact compensation, some of the things that we're looking to consider um, really the same as the expats, once again, we want to consider some of the the, the the various elements of compensation, tax equalization. So tax equalization looks to see that if they're going from a place of low tax to high tax, then basically we want to increase your salary to offset what that additional tax burden is. Work hours and overtime. We want to look and make sure that we're in compliance with what the standard work hours and overtime provisions are within a particular country. Mobility differences. We want to know uh, or mobility differential. You know, generally what we do when we are looking at an expat or an impat, impats less so than expats, but still sometimes depending on where they're coming from, there may be a mo mobility differential. So a, a, a certain percentage of salary generally uh, to just give them a, a boost to make it um, attractive for them to take the assignment. Cost of living differential, if they're going from a lower cost of living to a higher cost of living, then you're certainly going to provide an offset to to make it uh, comparable to where they are today. Post hardship differential. So if we're looking at sending them to a place that has a, a lower standard of living or lower quality of life, um, then we're going to provide generally a post hardship differential. So if we're taking somebody in and trying to take them to Afghanistan to do work or Iraq or Haiti or some of the areas that um, – the, the lifestyle, the quality of life is substantially different than what they're used to in their home country, then we would generally provide a percentage difference to uh, make it worth their while to do so. On top of that, we may have a da danger differential. So sending them to a place like in Afghanistan where um, technically it's still a war zone and they could be at danger or in risk, then we would provide some additional uh, differential to again make it worth the while to make the assignment. And finally, utilizing various bonus or incentive awards, uh, we may include a sign on and a project completion bonus uh, for particular projects they're being sent out to do. So the idea is we really need to do what we need to do and take into account where, you know, from where someone is going, coming to where they're going and make a, a package that makes sense for them. So looking at a little more in detail at some of those tax equalization, calculation of the loss due to differences in tax rates between home and host country. Um, just as an example, taxes in Europe are substantially higher than the U.S., so coming to the U.S. is frequently a big win for most foreigners. Um, are there exemptions for certain taxes, Social Security, Medicare-like taxes? Some companies have tax agreements that allow exemption uh, from host country welfare of taxes if continuing to pay tax in the U.S. or vice versa. So these are reciprocity agreements, basically. So that if somebody, let's say we're bringing a Brit to the U.S., and we're continuing to pay their, their national Social Security taxes in the U.K., they would be exempt from having to pay Social Security and Medicare taxes here in the U.S., Generally, I advise uh, that you use a third-party consultant, be it something like KPMG or PwC, to calculate proper equalization. Let them take that out of your hands and, uh, and do the right job on it. Wage hours and overtime, like I said, you need to understand where they're going to be, 
whether they abide by the U.S. law or the local law, wherever that is. Mobility multiplier, oftentimes, like I said, we include a flat percentage increase for the duration of the expat assignment. Generally, that's somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. And again, it's used it as an incentive to entice employees to volunteer to perform assignments. The post cost of living differential, again, looking at the home country versus host country to identify any uh, cost of living differences. Um, some companies may cover housing costs and provide a living stipend to, to cover such costs as meals and transportation rather than make an, a, a direct differential uh, change to the salary. Again, the post hardship danger or in danger differential, um, again, or posts that that have different quality of life or uh, potential health hazards, be it war or other things. And then finally, the bonus and incentive like we talked about. Benefits. So the type of benefits, expat benefits to address and define. We need to understand the welfare benefits that are available like Medicare, life, and disability. Uh, time off benefits, required holidays, vacation, sick, disability, maternity, etc. Retirement benefits. So what are we required to provide? So with welfare benefits, particularly when we look at medical, that's the primary. How will the employee be covered? We have a couple options. If they're coming into the, you know, if they're in PATS, we're going to basically bring them on to uh, the U.S. plan as quickly as possible. Bringing them on to a domestic plan is, is your, your best route and the cheapest route and uh, is preferable. If we're sending someone outside of the U.S., generally we're going to enroll them in an international plan that provides a network in most locations globally. Um, these tend to be very rich plans, but they're also very expensive. So we, we generally try to, again, keep it to those individuals who are, are generally relatively high employees that are going to be uh, somewhere on assignment. Other peripheral medical benefits, dental and vision. These are generally included in most international plans for expats. And um, if uh, someone is coming into the U.S., it's certainly cheaper to bring them onto the U.S. plans, just like the medical. Disability and life plans, you need to consult your plan in order to identify restrictions and limitations. Uh, you may need to have some additional riders. Um, so if you have an expat that you're sending overseas, there are certainly exemptions for uh, for death or injury that takes place in a war zone or a uh, natural disaster type stuff or terrorist events. So in those cases, you may need or want to provide a rider that would provide additional coverage in the event of uh, death or injury as a result of, of war or national disaster. Time off benefits. So you need to... Uh, Look at the holidays. Uh, again, the U.S. has no mandated paid holidays. Uh, vacation and sick leave. U.S. has no mandated vacation or sick leave, although some states have jumped on that. Disability and maternity leave, as we talked about, you know, within the U.S., we have 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Now, certainly for expats, it's quite a bit different. Expats, is, you need to understand what's out there for the uh, each country in which you operate, and it's going to be different. Two possibilities. Individuals may remain on home country pension, or they may enroll in U.S. retirement plan. Uh, so a lot of that's going to depend on the type of visa that they're on, the tenure or the length of the stay. Um, so, you know, depending on whether they're coming on to U.S. retirement plans or staying on, on the host country, um, sometimes it's not a choice you make, but it's something that you need to explore and come up with a solution and an answer for uh, so that you know how you're going to treat it. Performance management, how do we manage impacts? Too often we simply don't. Um, we do a horrible job usually when it comes to managing impacts and expats. We should apply appropriate metrics, uh, goals, expectations uh, to individuals on assignment. Um, we want to make sure that we are providing that feedback, that we're giving them appropriate uh, understanding of where they are and how they're performing. Acculturation and assimilation. For better or worse, companies generally do not provide good training for acculturation. Um, and this includes both in-pats and expats. But when we're dealing with in-pats into the U.S., you know, it's probably 
easier a lot of times bringing folks into the U.S. I think folks are, are tend to be probably more familiar with American culture than most Americans are accustomed to foreign cultures. So we tend to do really minimal when it comes to impacts into the U.S. Hopefully we do a little bit more for expats, but usually not all that much. Spouse and family, we need to understand whether the spouse and family will be joining the expat or the impact. If yet, there are a few things that we need to consider. We definitely want to get spousal support. We want to make sure that they're in agreement. You know, the, the one thing that will really kill an assignment um, is if the spouse decides that they are not satisfied, they're not fitting in, and they didn't want to go home. Um, that can, can often trigger whether or not uh, we, uh, we lose that person. So you need to consider what you're going to do with a working spouse. So if the individual has a spouse who's working, then you may need to help find that individual a position. You, and, and in some cases, you may actually employ the spouse as well. You need to consider the children, education. From an impact perspective, it's not so bad. They're going to come in, and generally, we've got good public schools. When we're dealing with expats, it's substantially more expensive because generally we're going to be funding or paying for private school to ensure they get the education that they need. And again, relocation to and from, return visits home, you need to define that all that up front before you get an agreement. And finally, repatriation, what happens when it comes time to come home? So we need to talk about re-entry re and, and reacculturation, time off for a move, resettling, you need to define what the new position is, what their new role is. How do you maintain that engagement? So often we do repatriation just terribly. We don't really define what the next step is, where they're going to go next, and they feel relatively isolated and disengaged. So we need to find a way to make it clear for them what the next step is, where we're going next, how we're moving, and what that's going to mean for them. All right, so that wraps up today's uh, lecture two. And uh, so the code word today is one of the greatest bands ever to come out, Guns N' Roses. Uh, so make sure that you go in and you uh, submit that uh, on the, uh, within the, the code word quizzes and uh, so you get credit for watching this. All right, thank you. Have a uh, great day and uh, good luck. Have a good one.